Well, good morning, Calvary. Hey, so good to see you today. Grab your Bibles with me, if you would, please. Turn to Luke chapter 15, whether you have it in a print or a digital form. I, I want to say a quick thanks to our board and to our staff. I think, and I, I've, I've kind of shared a little bit, but the last month have kind of been in and out quite a bit. Uh, we had the opportunity to travel and, and see our son who lives in Africa, and we had some kind of other unique experiences along the way and some really special family time last week that I'll share about here in just a moment. But uh, it is good to be home today and uh, we are starting a new series that we are calling coming home we're going to take the next four weeks and kind of do a deep dive into one of the best known stories that jesus teaches us in the gospels we're going to look at the parable of the prodigal son so we're going to do that the next four weeks and we're we're going to kind of take an insightful look into each one of the characters that's in this story so in two weeks on uh, the 31st of october we're going to look at the older son in this story. The week after that, the first week in November, we're going to take a look at the life of the younger son in this story. And I want to encourage you to, to maybe invite someone to join you for this series in particular. When you leave today, if you are uh, here in the building with us, whether here in Auditorium 1 or in Auditorium 2, you, you'll get a card like this that you'll be handed. And if you need to take more than one, go ahead and do that. We want to invite you to, to invite someone to come with you to church especially that, that, that first week of November is going to be a really important uh, message together. So I encourage you to invite someone to come with you to be your guest. Um, when, we, when we talk about someone that's a prodigal, that word's probably a good thing for us to define a little bit. Because the idea behind that word prodigal, which can have a, a negative or a positive connotation to different people, is it's someone who finds themselves far from home, whether that's in a personal sense, a physical sense, and a spiritual sense, and you know where you want to be, maybe even where you should be, but you find yourself far from home. And for many of us, we, we know people in our lives who it seems as though they're far from God and from their spiritual home. And if that's the case, I'd encourage you, invite them to jump in on this series. For some people, it may be they'll come to church with you. For others, it may be as simple as they'll, they'll join us online, or maybe they'll start watching the live stream or catching up on YouTube or Facebook or, or something like that. So I'd encourage you, invite someone to join you to be a part of what God is doing through this series. Next week, we're going to take a look at if you have someone in your life who is far from home, how do you love them in that season of their life. And maybe you're in this room, you're in Auditorium One, maybe you're watching this on a screen somewhere, maybe you're watching this online, TV, you're listening to the podcast, and you would say, actually, that's me. I kind of feel far from home. I want to welcome you. We are so glad that you're joining us. I want you to know that you have been prayed for Because there is a father who loves you. In fact, that's our focus today. We want to look at the father in this story today. If you're not familiar with this story, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three stories that deal with people finding things that are lost. And this, the parable of the prodigal son, is the third story. And we'll pick up in verse 11 and see what Jesus says here. Luke chapter 15, verse 11, here's what we read. Jesus continued, he's telling the next story, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate, so he divided his property between them. Let's focus here for just a minute, because I want you to kind of maybe dig into the culture at that time and understand what it is that this younger son says to his father. When he says, Father, give me my share of the estate, he's not just asking for a loan. When he says that in that culture, he's saying, Dad, your stuff means more to me than you do. You're as good as dead to me. I want my stuff more than I want you. Unthinkable in that culture would have ostracized him from his family and his community And yet that's the choice that he made. Dad, you're dead to me. Give me my stuff. And it wasn't as simple as his dad just pulling out the checkbook and saying, all right, you get half of what's in the bank account. Like there was was teaching in the ancient Jewish literature of that time 
that said that a father should never give his inheritance until he dies because if he gives it, what will he rely on in hard times? Does that make sense? But what does this father do? This father takes his assets. He's going to have to liquidate half of them to give them to his ungrateful and rebellious son. It gives a whole new meaning to the tension that Jesus' readers would have heard when Jesus taught a parable and said, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Here's how the story continues. Verse 13. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. So when it says that he got together all he had, it basically means he took all the things that his dad gave to him and he cashed them out. And he got a collection of cash and he left his, in, in, in Jesus' context, he left his Jewish community and he went off to the wild Gentile big city and there recklessly and immorally wasted and squandered his wealth on wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he finds a help wanted sign and he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. If you wonder how low he had to go, this is a good Jewish boy feeding pigs. Those things don't go together, do they? He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. This dude went from living the high life to hitting rock bottom. He is in a tough spot. Here's what we find next, verse 17. When he came to his senses, don't you like that line? Like, I love it. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, can't you see him standing in front of the mirror? I don't know if they had mirrors. He was standing in front of the mirror. And he was looking at himself and he said, I got to practice this. I got to rehearse this speech. I got to get it right when I talk to my dad. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and went to his father. Today's message isn't about the son. Like today we're talking about the father. In a couple weeks we'll, we'll do a deep dive into the life of the son. But do you see what he's doing here? He's like rehearsing his speech before he has the opportunity to say it in front of his dad. When do you do that? When do you rehearse what you're going to say? When you're nervous? When you're scared? when you're unsure, when you're uncertain, when you're pretty sure that this is not going to go well. So this kid is filled with tension and anxiety and uncertainty because he's not sure what he's walking into. So he's rehearsing his speech and he sets out to find his dad, verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. It's time for the speech. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He's just getting into the introduction of his sermon, isn't he? Watch what dad does. Verse, uh, verse, it, but time out, dad says. But the father said to his servants, quick. He turns from his kid, looks at the servants. He says, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. and Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Why the party? He says this, because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. That's a good word, isn't it? Because he is home. This is the story that you read all throughout Luke chapter 15, but comes to this big ending enclosure in this story. What was dead is alive again. What was lost is found. This is the story, the parable of the prodigal son. I've been chewing on this for the last couple of months, knowing that we were going to come to this, this series, to these weeks. I've asked myself, I wonder why. Like, why'd the kid ever leave home? What was it that made him want to leave in the first place? What was it that motivated him to do that? And what's interesting is we don't get that part of the story. Jesus gives us a lot of details in this parable, 
But there's a lot of things he leaves out. It seems like the details are vague so that the application can be wide. Because <laughs> I'm going to guess that every one of us at some point is going to see ourselves in the life of this young man. And it's interesting, we call this the parable of the prodigal son. But I think it could just as easily be called the parable of the loving father. Don't miss the point of this story. It's about the father. And it's about his love. And it's about what we see. And I, I can't give you specifics, but here's what I think. I think the reason that the younger son ran away from home is because he had a misunderstanding of who the father really was. Because he, he, he didn't have a healthy relationship for whatever reason. He, he didn't have a strong connection for whatever cause that might be. He had a misunderstanding of who his father was. And because of that, he found himself far from home. What I want to talk about today is three ways we miss God's love. And as we look at this story, I think if we're honest, we're going to see ourselves in the life of how this young man misunderstood who the father was. So let's take a look at this story. I want to talk about the heart of the Father and how if we're not careful, we can also miss God's love. Now, can I tell you this? As soon as I say we're going to talk about God's love, there's prone to be some people who go, oh, we're back to the basics. I didn't come here for basics today. I'm in the advanced class. Can I tell you when I usually mess up in life? It's when I forget about the basics. And these things are so important for us to look at today to make sure they're right in our lives. Three ways that we often miss God. Here's the first one. Number one, if you think God is against you, you're missing God's love. If you think that God is against you, you're missing God's love. I, I can't help but feel that this son somehow had this feeling that his father was against him in one way or another. Because you can sense the tension. Go back to, to the story's beginning at verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate, because your stuff means more to me than you do. You're better off dead to me. Can you feel the tension there? And yet there's a father who doesn't push and fight back. Instead, he divided his property between them. And you can feel that tension that's there between the father and the son. And somehow this son feels as though God or his father, who's pictured uh, of God in this story, that his father is against him. And if we're honest, I think that's true in our culture today. What do we love to do whenever something is wrong in our lives? We're quick to have a tendency to blame somebody else, don't we? Isn't that true? And we do it in our culture as well. And oftentimes... One of the first people we like to blame is a God who maybe we don't have much of a relationship with. We're quick to put that blame for things back on God. How many times have I heard people say, how many times have I even said myself, how could a loving God ever, and then you fill in the blank, how could a loving God ever allow that to happen? How could a loving God allow such a natural disaster or war, or tragedy, or sickness, or disappointment? How could a loving God allow that to happen in my life? How could a loving God let there be so much evil in the world? And I think one of the things that I've got to remember is it's not God who broke the world. Remember that? All those things we talk about, the, the, the sickness, the disease, the natural disasters, the war, the evil, the frustrations, the disappointment, the death, all those things come as a result of sin in the world. And that we live in a broken world. And the reality is, when you look at Scripture, God isn't in the business of breaking the world. He's in the business of saving it. He's going to great lengths to fix it. Anybody wish he'd fix it faster? Can I get an amen? amen. But it's not my timing. It's his. And as long as I'm alive in this world, I need to come to terms with the fact that there will be broken things. Things aren't going to go the way I always think they should. Life's not going to look the way that I want it to. And in those moments, I've got to remember, it's not because God broke it. He's the one I look to to fix it in my life. If you look at this story, when was it that there was finally this turnaround in the life of the son? He had to go through a famine. He had to get to the toughest spots. Can I tell you, and I, I want to lovingly encourage you, if you are in a spot in your life where you feel like God is against you, then there is no better time than right now for you to go running to him and to say, God, I need you for myself. 
Not what I heard in some church. Not the faith that my parents had or my neighbor had or that my friend had. God, I need to know your love for myself in this moment because it gets risky if all we know or, or ascend to in our minds about God is just the things we've heard from other people. And it's not going to take you long to hear people badmouth God and say, well, what kind of God would do this? Or how could a loving God ever do that? When the reality is we need to stop listening to the gossip in our culture and get to know the Father for ourselves. Does that make sense? I fell prey to this playground gossip. I was in kindergarten, and I remember it well. Near the end of the school year, some of the big bad first graders out there going, boy, you better pray, because next year you've only got two choices. In little Southington local schools in Southington, Ohio, there were only two first grade teachers. There was Mrs. Bauer, and there was Mrs. Lockhart. And they said, you need to pray because you want Mrs. Bauer, because she loves children. There are bluebirds and butterflies that fly around her head. Rainbows come out of her eyes. And she is sweet, and you will learn, and you will have fun because you want Mrs. Bauer, because she loves children. You do not want Mrs. Lockhart. She's old. And she's mean and she hates children. I mean, that was the word on the playground. I remember it so clear. So all summer, you know what I'm doing? Lord, if you love me, God, I'm six years old, but I'll do anything. Just don't let me get in Mrs. Lockhart's class. Guess whose class I got in when I got into the first grade? You can guess, can't you? Man, I walked in with fear and trembling because I, I could just, you remember Hansel and Gretel and in the oven they go, do you know what I'm talking about? That's what I pictured. That's what I thought was going to happen. And I got in that class, and can I tell you, some of my very best memories from elementary school were in Mrs. Lockhart's class, because she wasn't mean. She loved kids. I learned so much. I grew so much. I felt valued and appreciated in that class, but what it took was me not just listening to playground gossip, but actually getting to know her for myself. And too many of us get our impression about our Heavenly Father from things we've heard or thought or made up in our own minds when actually what we need to do is say, God, I need to experience your love for myself. Because guess what? He's not against you. He loves you. And if you think God is against you, you're missing out on God's love. The second thing I want to show you from, from this story, number two, is that if you think God is holding out on you, you're missing God's love. If you think God is holding out on you, you're missing God's love. One of the things I can't help but think motivated this young man to say, hey, dad, just give me my stuff, was because he felt like dad was keeping stuff from him, that there was something out there in the world that he needed to experience, that somehow he was missing out on some fun, some experience, some relationships, something that he just said, dad, you're holding back on me. I don't want to wait anymore. I want to do what I want to do, so don't hold out on me anymore. You're as good as dead to me. Give me my stuff. I am going to go because there's a life out there, and I want to enjoy it. I don't say that with judgmental criticism of that young man. I think if we're all honest, we say that with a recognition of, yep, been there. (laughs) There's been things that my sights got set on in times of my life. And I thought, I, I want to do that. I want to I try that. I know it's not right, but it feels like God's holding out on me. Yep. How do I know that? Because we all come, Scripture tells us, we all come to these crossroads where we have to make a decision. Where am I, where am I going to put my love? Where are my desires and affections going to go? Here's how John says it. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. He, he shows the crossroads, the contrast here. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. So you have a choice to make, just like that son, between all the things that are out there that you think you want and choosing to love the Father. Well, what are the things that we think we want? Here's what he says in verse 16. For everything in the world, lust the flesh, lust the eyes, pride of life. We could take time to define those, but those are kind of the three big buckets that John puts temptation in. He says that sin and temptation is going to come to you from the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Those come not from the Father, but from the world. So he says, look, when you come to the crossroad, when you have to decide where you want to put your love and affections, it's good for you to know this. 
Why? Here's verse 17. Because the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Why does the Father what, what he want what he wants for you? Because he knows that oftentimes we put our affections on things that aren't going to last. Here's what happens to us, though. We have this natural kind of built-in curiosity. And so we see things out there, and we go, oh, well, that, that makes me curious. So I desire that. And then if I let my desires take hold, I go after that. And my desires eventually, even though they may be satisfied and fulfilled for a season, are eventually going to lead to disappointment. Anybody? That curiosity fuels my desires, but my desires will lead to disappointment. And scripture says eventually that disappointment leads to death. But what John tells us is not the will of God. The one who pursues that lives forever. So what we tell ourselves is that God is holding out on us when actually he has his very best for us. Go back to the story. Luke chapter 15 Look at this, because it's not until the son gets back home that he realizes what he left behind. Luke chapter 15, verse 20. Remember, he's come with his speech. He gets through the opening of his sermon. The father says, time out. And instead, he calls the servants and he says, quick, bring the best robe. Who, who do you think owned the best robe in the house? Anybody who owned it? <laughs> who said daddy? That was a good, yes. <laughs> he was saying, bring my robe. You know, you know the one we got on vacation that we spent too much for? Bring it. Bring it and, and put that on him. Put a ring on his finger. Sandals on his feet. Why sandals? Sandals are for sons, not servants. Put those sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. There's a reason why it does not say go through the drive through at Chick-fil-A. Do you know why? Because they weren't having lunch on the back porch. Dad said kill the calf because we're inviting the neighborhood. Have everybody come because we're going to have a feast and we are going to celebrate. What happened is when the son came home, he realized, my father has everything I need. He's given me his very best because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. His dad wasn't holding out on him. He just wanted the very best for him. So oftentimes we get this idea that somehow God is holding out on us when actually he's just trying to give us the best that he has. One of the privileges, though, that I have as a pastor is to sometimes have a front row seat to watch when people, as, as that passage of Scripture says, come to their senses and say, you know what? I think I need to come home. And to watch those moments that happen. And every so often, this is, this is kind of a, a benefit of being in one church for a long time. Somebody will say, hey, can I, can I come talk to you? Based on long-term relationship, they'll sit down and they'll go, I think I want to come home. And for whatever reason, there's always this kind of step that, that happens where people go, but I did this and I did that and I made this choice and I made this mistake and I hurt God this way and, and I hurt the church that way and I hurt my family this way and they run through and almost every time there's this, this sentiment that comes out of them not just I made these mistakes or I had these bad choices or there were these sins in my life, but they say I am this and I am that and I am this and they define themselves by the things that they did and then they say, I don't know how God can love me because I'm this. I don't know how God can love me because I'm that. And I was sitting with somebody not too long ago and all of a sudden it just hit me and I said to them, you know, right now in this moment, what God is concerned about is not that you are this or that. What he's concerned about is that you realize that you are his daughter and you are his son and that he loves you more than he cares about what you think you are. And he just wants you to come home because he loves you. That's what we see about the father in this story. Look, the father is not against you. He loves you. And the father's not holding out on you. He loves you. And one more thing I want you to see. This is where we'll, we'll wrap up here today. Number three, if you think God is angry with you, you're missing God's love. If you think God is angry with you, you're missing God's love. Because here's, here's the pattern. Here's what happens. Whether it's because you think he's against you or they think you, he's holding out on you or who knows why else. What happens is there begins to be this space that grows 
and we get far from home. And there's this distance that grows but maybe between us and God, maybe between us and our family, maybe between us and our church or God's people or relationships. And we let that distance grow and there might be something in us that says, man, I'd like to, I'd like to go back home. I'd like, to, I'd like to see that distance shrink. But we say, I don't think I can because I'm sure they'll be mad at me. I'm sure they'll be angry with me. I'm sure there'll be conflict because of what I've done. And so instead, we let that, that gap stay there. Does that make sense? Can I just be super honest with you for a few moments? 20 plus years of ministry, I've, I've never seen that gap as much as I've seen it in the last 18 months. Because there's been so many things outside of our control, things that we as people, as a, as a world, as a nation, as a church, have never had to deal with before. And as a result, they've created the, the perfect storm for that gap to grow between us and God's people, between us and the church, between us and God himself. Three, three things that in particular I've seen that have kind of been um, the, the ingredients for this separation. One has been concerns about health, and rightfully so. There were steps we had to take in the midst of a very real pandemic, whether that be on a church level or state level, national level. And I know I'm not, I'm not talking about anything political. I'm just saying this was a real thing. And for many of you, something that was a very legitimate concern, or rightfully so that somehow then created this separation that was there. And so health unintentionally caused this gap, maybe between you and God's people, maybe even between you and your relationship with God. A second thing that I think came out of that season then was not just health, but habit. It became a habit for me to kind of keep that distance. It was easy for me to, to say, well, well, next week or, or at another time or when things are different. And so that space between us and God's people, maybe even between us and God, grew in that season. So I think it was health. I think it was habit. I also think it was hurt. That for some of us, we watched other people. We saw things in the news. We noticed stuff on social media. We had interactions with people that somehow put a wedge there. And then oftentimes we even connect that wedge from people back to God. And so whether it be health or habit or hurt, it's been easy for us to have a season for the last almost two years where that distance between us and God has grown. And many of us go, I know it's time for me to get back to church. Or I know it's time for me to connect with those people. Or I know it's time for me to make things right with God. But look at how far I've gone. How can I? How can I ever go back? How hard is that going to be? Because somewhere, I bet there's conflict. Somewhere, I bet there's something or someone that's going to be angry. Can I tell you? You are welcome home. Like those things, whether you're in this room, in Auditorium One, whether you are watching this online or on television, as a church, we welcome you home. It's what a family does. And we invite you, whether that's back to church or whether that's back to God, to come back home. Because that gap that's there, that you think is filled with conflict, tension, and anger, you know that those thoughts that come to you aren't coming from your heavenly father. They're coming from your demonic enemy <laughs> who wants you to think that that wedge is there when actually the love of the father looks much different than that. In fact, let's go back to what it looks like. Luke chapter 15, verse 20. It says, but while he was still a long way off, I, I've got this picture in my head. I've been to Israel three times. This is not biblical. My picture comes in. Have you ever the, remember the movie Gone with the Wind? Long driveway? Yeah, I get that picture. Even maybe more appropriate. I, anybody ever seen the, the great uh, story of, of, of Scripture in the church, Forrest Gump? You ever seen that one? <laughs> run, Forrest, run. You know what I mean? That long driveway? I picture the prodigal son walking down that driveway, rehearsing his speech. I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. And he's running through that in his head. 
And he's walking down the back of his head, run, Forrest, run, right? That's happening. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Does that sound like a father who's angry to you? No, especially, I mean, we, we with our motion picture mindset, we hear the music and we see the father jump off the porch. I don't think there was a porch, but in my head there's a porch. Are you with me? Can I get an amen on that? So he jumps off the porch and he goes running to his son and you can hear the soundtrack playing behind you, but it wasn't that majestic. See, in the Near East in that time, even in the Middle East today, an adult male is dignified. They wear their robes. They walk in a purposeful and meaningful manner. To run would be demeaning. It would be disrespectful. It would be humiliating. That father would not run. And he certainly would not run to a son who said, I wish you were dead. This father did. This father saw his son. He said, that's my boy. And I don't care what anybody else says. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him because my boys come home. The reason Jesus tells this story is because no matter who you are or what you've done, he wants you to know God's love. What kind of love is it? Well, well, Paul prays the same prayer. Look at this in Ephesians chapter three. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That's a powerful statement. How's it going to happen? He says, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, long, high, and deep. Why does he use those words? Because he wants you to understand, I'm talking about something that is huge. He says, I want you to grasp how huge the love is Christ is the love of Christ is and to know this love that surpasses knowledge i want you to know it because you'll never understand it that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of god if there's that gap between you and god this story is a reminder that he's not angry at you he's actually looking for you he's just waiting for you to come home He's up on that porch that he didn't have, scanning the horizon, saying, where's my daughter? Where's my son? I just want him to come home. Last week, we had such a cool experience as a family. We, uh, we got to go to Chicago, and our son Clayton got to run in the Chicago Marathon. And uh, it, it, I'm not a runner, so that was that, I didn't know how big of a deal it was. But there's six major marathons in the world, and one of them is in Chicago. And you can't just sign up; you have to submit your name to a lottery. And if your name gets chosen, then you get to you get to run in the race. So Clayton was like, "Well, I'll just I'll just give it a shot." And so he submitted his name, and he didn't intend for this to happen, but he got chosen. And he was like, "Oh, now I got to train! Like, <laughs> like this is hard." And so he, he got chosen. He worked hard for months so that he'd be ready, had an injury, kind of had to sit it out, kind of wait, like the whole, the whole process. And then so we were like, hey, we're going to make this a, a big deal. And I didn't know how big of a deal it was. It was kind of a once in a lifetime thing for our family and so glad that we made it a priority. Here's a picture. This is Clayton. He's smiling because it's mile two. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was different at mile 26. Yeah, and it's helpful for him that his wife's a photographer. Isn't that a great picture? We're submitting that to Chicago as the like promo for next year. It's just a great shot, you know? He's a good-looking kid. It just looks like his dad. And so you got this, like, so the, our job then, right? Our job then was to follow him around Chicago, which is not as easy as it sounds. So we had mapped out five different spots that we would get to, either by walking or hopping on and off the subway. you got to recognize there's, there's about 32,000 runners in this race. So we're not the only ones doing this. And so you're, you're hopping on and off the subway, and we got to know people a whole lot more than we wanted to on those trains. And you, know, you're kinda, you, you kind of scope it out. There's an app that they have 
that that numbered bib that he's wearing has like a little chip in it. So you can look at the app and it keeps track of where he is the whole time, which is kind of cool. So you would look at the app and go, okay, now where, where do we want to be and where's he at and how do we get there? And you'd get there and then you'd find a spot and you'd kind of try to find a place on the sidewalk. Now, I want to I wanna set a couple things straight real quick. I skipped church last Sunday. Will you forgive me? Okay. And then there were moments when people tried to crowd in on my spot last Sunday that I didn't act very pastoral. Will you forgive me? Because there's moments it's like, get out of my way, the kid's coming, right? Because you're looking. You're looking at the app, and you're looking up. You're looking at the app, you're looking, okay, I've got about another. He's going to be here in about another mile. And so you're watching, and you're waiting. And you're kind of, oh, he's kind of, he should be around the corner any minute. You're just kind of watching, and you're straining your neck, and you're kind of looking, and you're kind of hoping because you're waiting to see when your person comes around the corner. And you don't want anyone else being in your way because he's only going to see you for a couple of seconds. And you want him to know that you are there, right? I am proud to announce that he finished the race. Here's a picture right after we were able to uh, reconnect with him. That's the whole squad right there. And, and, and Carissa and Rhonda made these shirts that said Team Clayton on them, right? They're for sale in the atrium. No, 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 no. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Got to pay for Chicago Strip somehow, right? You know, so I'm kidding. It's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. So we got these t-shirts. He said it was about the third or fourth time he saw us that he finally realized what the shirt said. Because he's kind of running by, and each time you're like, oh, that's it. They're wearing the same. Oh, it's a, that's my name. You know? And it was such a cool experience. About five times we were able to catch him along the way. Fourth time we were standing in the Chinatown neighborhood in Chicago. And I'm standing there, and we we're all kind of craning our necks to look for Clayton. He's kind of got a distinct look about him. He's tall. And every so often, a tall kid with a beard would round the corner. And we'd be like, there he is, there he is. Not him, you know? Because you're waiting for your person. Like, you're looking for your guy to come around the corner. And I'm standing there. And for whatever reason, you're just a bundle of nerves. And you're like, I don't want to miss him. And you're looking and you're watching. And I felt the Holy Spirit just whisper in my heart, do you think that's the feeling the father had? When he was waiting to see his son run towards him, he's just looking and he's watching. He's scanning the horizon, saying, where's my daughter? Where's my son? Where's my person? I just want to see him because I love him. 32,000 people. I was looking for one kid, mine. And you might be prone to say, in this whole world, after all I've done, does God really care about me? Can I tell you, God's got a t-shirt with your name on it. And he's just watching. He's not against you. He's not holding out on you. He's not angry with you. He's just waiting and watching for you. Because all he wants is for you to come home. Can I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? In this room, if you're watching online, you're watching on TV, would you just take a quiet moment and be honest with yourself? How's your relationship with the Father? Do you feel like He's against you? Because if that's the case, there's no better time for you to say, Father, I need to know your love in a real way. Do you feel like He's holding out on you? Can I tell you that what he wants for you is actually just his very, very best? And if there's this gap between you and God, and you're afraid of what might happen if, if it began to close, can I tell you he's not angry with you? In reality, he's watching for you. Because he can't wait for you to come home. Just a moment, we're going to stand. We're going to sing a familiar and a simple song that says, you are a good, good father. And I'm going to ask you to do more than just sing a song. But however God is speaking to your heart, would you just say, Father, I need your love today. God, that's our prayer. We need to know your love. Thank you for this simple story that reminds us that you're not against us. You're not holding out on us. You're not angry with us. 
you're watching and waiting because your love is calling us home. Thanks for being our good, good Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing this song together. A thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. You tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. No, oh, I've seen many searching for it. online television right now because the way this story ends if you read through not just the rest of this parable but the rest of the book we find that God loved us loved me loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus his one and only son Jesus and that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and my sins 
to pay the price for those things that have created that gap between us and God so that we wouldn't have to just deal with that gap but that it would be closed by his forgiveness and his grace his peace his his deliverance and freedom in our lives that Jesus died on the cross and then on the third day that he rose again so that we could know life so that we could have hope so that we could have purpose so that we could have the promise of heaven and that that gift is available to us because of the love of God and I guess I'd have two questions as we wrap up today if if you are in this room you're auditorium one you're you're watching, you're listening, and you would say, Jesus, I thank you for the gift of love in my life. I know you as my Savior and my Lord, and I'm so thankful for God's love. If that's you, would you just raise your hand just as an act of praise and worship to thank God. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your work in my life. And here's my second question, is that maybe you would say, I'm not so sure I can raise my hand on that one. But I know I need that, that I need God's love, and that I need his forgiveness, that I need his purpose in my life, and I don't want to do it on my own anymore. And today I need to begin, or very likely, maybe you'd say, today I need to begin again, a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And whether it's for the first time, or for the thousandth time. If you need to say, Jesus, I need your forgiveness. God, I need your love. I give you my life. If that's you, would you just raise your hand right where you are, in this room, somewhere else, just raise your hand, raise it, put it right back down, just between you and God. I need to begin or begin again a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Anybody else, just between you and God, lift the hand, put it right back down. Just a statement of faith. If you raised your hand either one of those times, can I ask you to kind of repeat after me? Pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus, for sending your son to die for my sin. I ask today that you'd forgive my sin, be my savior. I give my life to you, my risen Lord. Show me your love. I give myself to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Look, if you're watching or listening to this and you prayed that prayer, I want to invite you to go out to our website. You'll see a spot there that talks about how to get to know Jesus. Click there. We would love to send you some information and some insight onto how to grow in that relationship. If you prayed that prayer for the first time here today, I hope you'll stop by out in the atrium where you see it says new here. We've got some friends there. We'd love to give you a Bible that's easy to read and understand and uh, maybe some insight and and pray with you about uh, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. In particular, maybe for those of you who didn't just pray that prayer for the first time, but you knew you needed to pray it this time, Can I tell you, one of the things that the enemy will want to do is not too long after you walk out of these doors today or you stop listening or watching this service, there's going to be this moment where the enemy's going to tell you that nothing's different, nothing changes, and this thing isn't real. And can I tell you, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, but that's a lie. And don't let that deception be the thing that determines your direction in your life. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you. Thanks for your word and how it speaks to us. Thank you that we walk out of this service with a reminder of just how loved we are by our good, good Father. Lord, as we go, would you send us with your special favor and with your wonderful peace? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.